A very good afternoon to all gathered in this virtual platform. Ratislaw College, welcome you all to this international webinar on brain-inspired computing. Today's webinar session is organized and hosted by Ratislaw College Guruvayur Kerala and myself as Ms. Hida Paulson, Assistant Professor at the Department of Computer Science and the coordinator for the seminar. Lithisla College Guruvayur is a prestigious women's college in Kerala, founded by the sisters of the Franciscan Clarist Congregation in the year 1955. The college offers 26 programs across 22 departments with around 2,000 young learners. Recently, the college is adorned with the glory of A plus grade in the national level accreditation by the autonomous body NAC by the government. Department of Computer Science of Lithisla College is really proud to host this international webinar today on the topic brain inspired computing. We are very much fortunate to have Mr. Abu Sebastian, the eminent researcher in this field as the resource person of the day. The session is also enriched with the presence of participants from various parts of India, UAE and United States. To officially welcome the gathering, I invite the head of the Department of Computer Science, Dr. Sister Marina A. Over to you, Sister. Sister Marina, you are welcome to begin with the welcome speech. Respected resource person of the day, Dr. Abu Sebastian, Principal Reverend Dr. Valsa M.A., beloved faculty members from various colleges, researchers, my dear students, a very warm good afternoon to everyone. Human brain is a remarkable organic supercomputer. It has been a long-standing dream of computer scientists to build systems that compute information in the way that the brain does. I hope this webinar will be an eye-opener for all the participants in the area of brain-inspired computing. It is a moment of extreme pleasure to welcome you all to the international webinar organized by the Department of Computer Science, Little Flower College, Budwai. I am profusely delighted to welcome the chief guest of the day, Dr. Abu Sebastian. He is a distinguished research staff member and technical manager at IBM Research Zurich. And he was a contributor to several key projects in the space of storage and memory technologies. Currently, he leads the research in memory computing at IBM series. He is an IBM master inventor since 2016. He was named principal and distinguished research staff member in 2018 and 20 respectively. He has published 180 articles and holds 50 patents. Dear sir, we are honored to have you as a resource person for this international webinar. On behalf of the Department of Computer Science, Little Flower College, Gudivayur, I extend a warm welcome to you, sir. Our dear principal, Reverend Dr. Valsa Yame, pillar of Little Flower College, Gudivayur. She is a woman of great energy. With her meticulous planning, she amazes us as always. With deep sense of gratitude, we welcome you, sister, to this August gathering. The fastest response what we received from the very date of the webinar release was very heartening. Today, we have more than 300 registrations to this event. On behalf of Department of Computer Science, 
I welcome all the delegates from all the colleges and all the participants in and around the world to this webinar. Now let me welcome my dear colleagues and dear students to this great event. I conclude my words. Let me remain. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sister, for that warm welcome. Reverend Dr. Sister Walsa May, the principal of our college, is an able leader and a very vibrant personality who always guide and support us in all our endeavors. I welcome our respected principal, Dr. Sister Walsa May, to officially inaugurate the webinar session and to deliver the inaugural address. Welcome you, sister. A warm good afternoon to one and all. Happy greetings from Little Flower College, Guruvayu. Welcome to all the delegates from the different parts of the world. Brain-inspired computing refers to computational models and methods that are mainly based on the mechanism of the brain rather than completely imitating the brain. Android Kunyapan, the Malayalam film, is familiar to all Keralites, and we began to think about robots to assist human beings in each and every field. The topic of our webinar is a matter for wide discussion among the academic circle. First of all, I took this opportunity to congratulate Dr. Sister Marina Alu, head of the computer science department and coordinator, Ms. Hida Paulson, and faculty member, Mr. Justin James and others for, for taking initiative to conduct this international webinar. Today's resource person, Mr. Abu Sebastian, is an active person for this seminar. I hope this will be a grand success with the eminent researcher, Mr. Abu Sebastian. I'm immensely glad to inaugurate this webinar. Wishing you a great event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sister, for your kind words. Before begin with the session, it's my privilege to introduce to you the resource person of the day. Dr. Abu Sebastian was born in Kerala and he received his MS and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Lowa State University in United States. Since 2006, he is a research staff member at IBM Research Zurich, and he was a contributor to several key projects in the space of storage and memory technologies and currently manages the research efforts on in-memory computing at IBM Research. He also serves on the leadership team of the IBM AI Hardware Center headquartered at Albany. In 2015, he was awarded the European Research Council Consolidated Grant, and in 2020, he was awarded an ERC Proof of Concept Grant. He is an IBM Master Inventor since 2016. He was named Principal and Distinguished Research Staff Member in 2018 and 2020, respectively. In 2019, he received the Owenski Lectureship Award for his contributions to phase change material for cognitive computing. He has published over 180 articles in journals and conference proceedings. He also holds over 50 granted patents. Dear sir, we are very much honored to have you here in this virtual platform today and we are eagerly looking forward to your talk on brain-inspired computing. Wholeheartedly welcome you to this webinar session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hita. Um, I would like to really thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Sister Mariana, and uh, also my cousin, uh, Professor Sdara Urumbil, who is on the faculty uh, at, uh, at Little Flower. So it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and. Um, uh, yeah, I, I really, uh, uh, let me just start sharing now and then I can continue. Okay, sir, we'll be.
Okay, hope I got the right screen. <laughs> Yes, sir. The presentation is visible. It's okay. Fantastic. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, so I think as, as many of the speakers already alluded to, uh, brain-spread computing is kind of like the, the next frontier in science, right? So I think it's it's very essential that all the you know upcoming students, the younger generation, um, and also the, the upcoming researchers are familiar with what is going on in this field. Uh, it is it's an active area of research, a lot of activity going on. So you should at least get a, a broad overview of what are the key research problems that are out there. And that's kind of what I aim to do today. Uh, I want to make it uh, fairly uh, interactive. So if there are any questions along the way, please stop me and you can ask me, or you know, we can also have a long discussion towards the end of the talk if that is more convenient. But don't hold back any questions if they're like really burning and you have to get it out. Um, right. So. Uh, before I start with the topic of brain spread computing, I just want to briefly uh, uh, mention where I come from as uh, as the speakers before me uh, mentioned earlier. So I work for IBM Research. IBM Research has many global labs and IBM Research Zurich, the one in Europe, uh, is one of the oldest. Um, it was established in 1956. And if I heard it uh, correctly, I think Little Flower was what, 1955. So I think we were kind of born at the same time. Um, IBM Research Zurich uh, has, you know, has many nationalities. You can see uh, it's not a huge lab. We are around 300, 350 scientists, uh, students, and postdocs. Um, I mean, we are most famous for the two Nobel prizes we got in 1986 and 87 for physics. Uh, so that's that's kind of our main, you know, achievement. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, you know, it's, it's a very thriving uh, research center of IBM uh, who is responsible for many inventions like the token ring um, and, uh, and also many of the things were listed uh, here within the Nobel Prize uh, list here, like, like scanning probe, microscopy, uh, high temperature superconductivity and so on. So that's where, uh, where I come from and it's, uh, it's located in Zurich, Switzerland, very close to the Zurich Lake, as you can see here in the background. Um, now, the, the group that I manage is called In-Memory Computing Group. Uh, we are um, mostly interested in exploring new forms of computing, um, brain spread computing being one of the most prominent ones in that area. And uh, naturally, this is a huge topic, you know, with, uh, as you can see later on, I mean, we'll be building chips and, you know, so on. So, of course, we collaborate a lot with other partners. Uh, in particular, the IBM AI Hardware Center, which um, is headquartered in uh, in Albany, New York. And uh, we also work a lot with academic institutions around the world. Uh, again, some of the most prominent ones are listed here. And we also get a lot of external funding, not just IBM funding, but external funding uh, from European and Swiss uh, funding agencies. So now let's uh, move on to the... Uh, to the topic of the day, so it's brain spread computing. So I just have uh, structured it into uh, six part essen parts essentially. So in the, in the first part, um, I just want to talk about you know just about you know what is human brain all about and you know what is the what is going on in terms of uh, our efforts towards understanding it. Uh, then I will spend some time on the so-called artificial neural networks. It's uh, one of the brain-inspired paradigms out there. Uh, then some kind of a historical um, analysis of uh, where AMMs stand and how it benefited from the IT revolution. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, new computing systems that are being built uh, specifically for artificial neural networks. And this is also kind of where uh, uh, much of my research is focused on. Um, again, um, we'll talk about uh, some of the algorithmic advances in artificial neural networks Again, tying in with some of the work that we do in Zurich. And finally, I'll provide an outlook and, and summary. Right, so the, the human brain, as you know, is, is, is one of the most uh, intricate objects in our universe, if you think about it. Um, it weighs less than two kilograms. Um, it consumes approximately 20 watts of power. Uh, it's kind of what you, you know, what a regular light bulb consumes, as you know. Um, yet, this kind of defines our identity and creates a model of the world and reality around us. So if you think about it, the whole world that we experience is essentially a manifestation of the computing that our brain does, right? So it is essentially, um, it is just defining your identity. When we talk about um, uh, like, like a human being, um, 
and his imaginations and his dreams and whatever, everything is captured by this organ, which is right on top of our neck. Um, what is really remarkable is that uh, brain itself is kind of uh, secluded, right? It is within the skull. It has no real sensory perception, but of course it is tied to sensory organs like the eyes and, and whatnot, which kind of let in photons or sound waves into the system. Uh, but with that very modest sensory perception, um, we are able to ponder the origins of the universe and work out the physics of subatomic particles. And it's all due to this thing here, right? So it is really a remarkable engine in that, in that sense. Um, so for centuries, uh, uh, people have been trying to understand uh, how brain computes. Um, so it has been uh, this long-standing dream of computer scientists uh, to build systems uh, that compute or process information in the way that the brain does. So even uh, 200 years back, uh, Lady Lovelace, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's one of the first computer scientists, and it was a woman in those times. Um, and she was assistant to Charles Babbage. Uh, he's, he was a pioneer in, in computing technology. He tried to build this computer uh, 200 years back, but he was way ahead of his time. So he didn't even have the right parts to do that. But he was one of the first ones who thought about how a computer should look like. And uh, Lady Lovelace was his assistant for a period of time. And so she used to create these very beautiful notes on her notebook, and one of them reads like that. So I have my hopes, and very distinct ones too, of one day getting cerebral phenomena such that I can put them into mathematical equations. In short, a law or loss of mutual actions of the molecules of brain. Then she says, I hope to bequeath to the generations a calculus of the nervous system. So 200 years back, even before we had you know, any computer, um, Lady Lovelace was already talking about you know, how the brain might be computing and how to put it down in terms of equations. So really remarkable. Uh, but then you look at, you know, Alan Turing, um, you know, he's widely regarded as one of the fathers of computer science. Um, and he was fascinated by this question as to whether machines can ever think. Um, so actually one of his uh, most famous works was in this domain. And, and that's why it's called the Turing test. So it was one of his tests that he proposed whereby you can tell apart a robot. You know, there was this nice mention of Android Hunyatan, right? So yes, yeah, so whether we can tell apart a robot uh, from uh, from a real human being. So that's kind of the essence of Turing test. So, but Turing was really fascinated by this problem. Uh, then comes Sir John von Neumann, arguably one of the cleverest people uh, ever, ever lived on planet Earth. Um, so he was one of the architects of modern computing systems. Um, and he spent his last years writing the book titled The Computer and the Brain, um, which unfortunately he could not finish because he, he died of cancer uh, rather young. But but he was also thinking towards the end of his life mostly about you know how we could mimic um, the human brain. So essentially, uh, this is an age-old problem, and as I said, it is really the frontier of science, right? I mean, we have figured out uh, Big Bang theory, and we have figured out the origins of universe. We have figured out quantum mechanics, but we still haven't figured out. Uh, how the thing which is on top of our neck uh, and something which came about like 2 million years in African savanna uh, yeah, works, right? So that's, that's really kind of, uh, if you think about it, it's really, uh, uh, really astonishing that we are, we are nowhere close to that. Um, so despite, you know, all the centuries long interest in how the brain works, uh, only uh, by the turn of the 20th century did we, did we start getting insights into the building blocks of the brain. Uh, in large part due to the pioneering works of um, scientists such as this gentleman here, he's a Spanish scientist by the name of Santiago Ramon y Cajal, uh, we started getting a glimpse into the neural networks that help the brain process information. So Cajal, uh, he, he was a very diligent scientist. So he made beautiful detailed sketches of what he saw under the microscope. So he used to make these thin slices of the brain tissue and then map out all the connections right between this. Um, remarkable individual. I mean, he was the son of a village doctor, uh, you know, grew up in, um, uh, in, in rural Spain, uh, and he, he became the professor, of, uh, a professor at Ma Madrid, and he was eventually awarded the Nobel Prize in 1906 for all these efforts that he did. So even today, his drawings are being heavily used by computational neuroscientists. It's really remarkable. Um, and then on, uh, you know, so we, we kind of now know a little bit more about the brain, right? We know that neurons and synapses are central to how brain computes. 
Um, so here are uh, shown two neurons interconnected by the so-called synapses. So these are kind of like the basic computing units. Um, so this, let's say this neuron is called the presynaptic neuron and this is called the postsynaptic neuron. And then, you know, these tiny connections between neurons, they are called the, uh, the synapses, right? So that is these, these connections, they increase or decrease in strength as, as uh, there are signals propagating uh, through the neurons. And if you look at, uh, see one of these, um, you know, the cell body of the, of the postsynaptic neuron, we call it the soma. What it does is it will aggregate this information that is flowing to it. And if the total uh, strength of the signal exceeds a certain threshold, then this neuron um, fires, right? So, it, you know, these are the signals again coming in the form of spikes. They get aggregated, they get weighted by the synapses, aggregated in the soma, and when they reach a certain threshold, they start firing. Um, as I said, the synapses are these small gaps located at the very end of the axon terminal. They are like 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer kind of gaps, really tiny. And how they communicate is actually electrochemical signaling. So there are these neurotransmitters uh, which kind of, uh, you know, which get released and get absorbed and so on. So it's a, so there are electrical pulses, chemical, um, you know, channels, right, where you translate into the next neuron and so on and so forth. It's a fascinating engineering feat if you think about it, how, uh, how these things work. So as I said, so now let if you look at the human brain in its totality, it is this organic supercomputer. Uh, the, uh, the human brain has approximately 80 billion neurons, um, around 14 billion of them in the so-called, uh, purely in the cerebral cortex. That's where most of our high level thinking is happening. So when I'm giving this talk, I am most likely using the cerebral cortex. Um, and it has over 240 trillion synapses. So these are these connections between neurons. So each uh, neuron is kind of connected to say 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons via these synapses. So just to give you a sense of the size of this connectivity, so if you assume that each of these synapses is storing just one bit of information, let's say it's just a connection or a no connection, right? Then the amount of information uh, that is available is equivalent to 30 terabytes. Uh, which is around 800 books per day for 100 years. So that's the amount of memory capacity that our brain has. Um, 800 books per day for 100 years. So every day you are getting a whole book to read, or rather 800 books to read. Um, and if you look at the total connectivity, the total length of all the nerve fibers, uh, it is approximately 150,000 kilometers in length. Um, and the activity of the brain is widely distributed. Um, so it's a highly parallel computer. It's sort of like a, you know, a compute cluster, like, a, I mean, as many of you know from the computer science world. Um, so it's a, it's a huge, massively parallel computer. And it is remarkably efficient, right? So by some estimates, the efficiency is around uh, peta ops per joule. Uh, it is, I mean, as I said again, you know, it is around 20 watts. It's like a light bulb, right? And, and you're able to do these remarkable things. And uh, it's also remarkably robust. Uh, so right now when I'm speaking, I am potentially losing uh, tens of hundreds of neurons and it is not likely to affect uh, uh, my presentation in a significant manner. So uh, imagine that you have a computer where your parts are falling apart uh, and, uh, and good luck, right? That it works uh, like that, uh, uh, like in the case of the brain. So essentially all of us are uh, possessing this unique, large organic supercomputer. And uh, it's also unique because this, there's no other computer, there's no other brain like yours, right? It's, it's so unique, it is create, It is uh, the result of your genes, it's the result of your environment you grew up in. Um, and all those people who lived the last, uh, you know, how many ever years, right? So all those DNA, all the effects have made this unique uh, organic supercomputer. Um, and, uh, and for me, it is a real shame uh, if you are not using that properly, so especially for the students, right? So if you think about it, you're you are born with this giant supercomputer, and then if you're not using it in a proper manner by doing something useful with it, it need not be science, but it can be art or music or whatever, then it will be an absolute shame of this huge engine that we are processing. Um, yeah, so that is kind of, uh, I just want to, uh, all of you be in awe with, you know, what, we are possessed with, right? This remarkable engine uh, on top of our necks. Um, so now, how do we go about figuring out how this engine works? That's all about brain-spied computing, right? 
Um, so our, our, our dreams of unraveling how brain computes um, has some parallels to how we conquered flight. So again, this was one of the problems where, you know, we always wondered how do birds fly? It was an age old question for centuries. So a lot of people spend significant amounts of time studying birds in flight. Uh, you know, there, are, there were guys who try to recreate exactly the brain as it is, sorry, exactly the, the bird wing as it is. Some people built, a lot of people died trying out stuff like that, jumping from cliffs with uh, parachutes uh, shaped like bird wings. But eventually we figured out, okay, the trick is not really in the wings or whatnot, but it's really in the so-called uh, Bernoulli's law, right? So we figured out this aerodynamic lift arising from Bernoulli's law. Uh, so this was the fundamental principle that was missing, right? So the whole idea that, you know, the pressure of air uh, will be slightly different depending on the velocity with which it is traveling. So this was a key and all the wings and colors of the wings and whatnot were just distractions along the way. Uh, but then once we figured out, oh, this is the key principle, we started building uh, these amazing engines who can fly, uh, who can carry hundreds of people on board, um, and uh, they are better than any bird alive. So this is kind of the, the path that happened. And the expectation is that we will hopefully pursue a similar kind of path when it comes to how brain computes. Uh, again, uh, you know, there is a brain sitting here, it's organic supercomputer, but we need this adequate theory of how brain computes, to paraphrase Lady Lovelace, the calculus of the nervous system. So once we figure out, okay, what is that essence of how brain computes, then we can potentially create engines which can rival even natural intelligence because natural intelligence uh, is mostly arising from, you know, the limitations of evolution or availability of materials and so on. Uh, I, I just want to just throw in a, a like a side remark. If you think about it, brain already has some very interesting materials. Like some of the key elements in the brain are potassium or calcium, which are uh, you know rather heavy elements, right? If you think about it, a brain mostly sorry, our body mostly has carbon, oxygen, and you know some of the lighter elements. But but brain has potassium, calcium, and and, and some of these other things, which as you know are not naturally available. Uh, like in, a, in you know you know how they are produced is in all these heavy elements are produced by a nuclear uh, fusion. Um, and typically to produce such heavy elements, you need to be like, you know, part of like a supernova explosion or something. So in some sense, there's a lot of uh, star dust uh, in our brain already, right? So it's all the, I mean, that's another, uh, you know, very interesting thing that we have to keep in mind that it's actually indeed, it also has some elements like that in addition to just carbon and, uh, and, and hydrogen and, and oxygen. But anyway, so coming back to the, to the, to the point I'm trying to make, um, so we need to kind of get an adequate theory of how brain computes. Um, and then from there, uh, the hope is that now we can make this uh, super, you know, intelligent beings. Uh, of course, I mean, you know, this is kind of the, the eventual goal, right? Uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, differences with flight. Flight was a much, much simpler problem, right? And that is why we were able to achieve this in, in such a remarkable amount of time. But a human brain is a much more complicated beast. And uh, it's most likely that we will only be able to uh, achieve this goal in steps. In a sense, we may have to realize brains by computing at multiple levels of abstraction instead of having this one giant superhuman uh, uh, machine that is there. Okay, so let's now look at one such abstraction of the human brain and how that is reshaping our world as of now. Um, so in 1943, um, Warren McCulloch, he's a neuroscientist and Walter Pitts is a logician. Um, they created a simple mathematical abstraction of, his, of a neuron. So they took this original picture that I showed and uh, they said, okay, what about capturing how this works in a very simple mathematical model? Right. So what they did is, okay, they said, okay, the sum of the neuron uh, can be represented by a node that receives, say, logical inputs because these are spikes, right? So there's either a spike or a no spike. So it is a one or a zero signal. And then it just aggregates. And based on the aggregated uh, information, uh, whenever, you know, it kind of uh, uh, goes over a threshold, you start issuing another spike, right? So you start issuing a zero or a one. Very simple model that captures just the essence of what a biological neuron does. So that is the famous McCulloch Spitz neuron. So this was the very first attempt way back in 1943 to start creating these simple mathematical models of how um, biological neurons compute in some sense. 
Um, so then, since then, um, you know, the, the, this original idea was called the McClock Spitz neuron, and then came so called perceptron, where you know it was again very similar to the McClock Spitz neuron, but they also added some weights in the in the path. So it was not just that you aggregate the logical inputs, but you start weighting them a little bit to kind of capture the synaptic aspect of it. Um, and then people started putting them together. So they adding this, uh, you know, perceptrons one of the other, and this is what you call multi-layer perceptrons. Um, and then the question came, okay, how do you uh, learn the synaptic weights uh, to do something? Um, and that is when backpropagation came. It is again an algorithm which kind of figured out how the how the uh, synaptic weights are tuned. So it's again one of the fundamental problems in the brain. So we know that we have this neural network of neurons and synapses, and the learning is all about the tuning of the synaptic weights, or and much of learning is about that. And the, the question is, okay, how do you tune the weights? And one such approach was the so-called backpropagation of errors, or so the gradient descent with backpropagation of errors. And that's what we typically call backprop. So all this stuff was worked out uh, already in the 1980s. So um, there was this period of time, there was a lot of activity where they worked out much of the theory of it. Uh, but these things were not doing much. They were like really not able to, uh, they were able to do like small classification tasks, you know, but nothing beyond that. Maybe at the most they could just, uh, you know, you could write a digit and say, oh, this is seven or this is three or something like that. But uh, it, it didn't have any other uh, power beyond that. Uh, so, so it kind of, um, you know, for 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 a couple of decades, there was really not much happening other than that people developed these neural models. There were also some insights about the architecture of uh, neural networks from computational neuroscience, in particular studying vision cortex and you know visual cortex and so on, but nothing really much. Um, so, but something else was going on uh, on the side. So in 1947, it was uh, you know just after the McClock Spitz neuron was was kind of invented. Um, uh, a key invention uh, occurred, uh, and that would completely change the world. And that was the invention of the transistor. So the transistor is, uh, you know, for those of you who are familiar, it is just like a switch uh, for electrons, right? So if you, if it's a, it's a device, you know, it's a, it's a nanoscale device. Um, it, it can switch the flow of electrons, whether it can turn on and off the flow of electrons. It was invented by uh, Shockley, Bardeen, and Bretain, um, in, and, and they actually won the Nobel Prize for this invention in 1956. In fact, John Bardeen went on to win two Nobel Prizes uh, in physics. So it's one of the, I think there are only four people who have won two Nobel Prizes, and I guess there's only one of them who has won two Nobel Prizes uh, in, in physics, and, and Bardeen is one of them. So these three invented this, this uh, transistor in 1947, and I would argue that this is probably the single greatest invention of humankind. This completely changed the world upside down, right? I mean, if you, in the, in the subsequent decades. And how did that happen? Um, uh, people started integrating these transistors into computer chips. And, um, and then they started integrating more and more transistors because you know, the so-called Moore's law kicked in whereby people learned how to kind of make this smaller and smaller and pack chips with more and more transistors. So this is a graph which shows how we were packing transistors in microprocessors over the last 42 years. And as you can see, in 2017, uh, we are in the range of 10 billion transistors. Uh, so remember that's in the thousands, right? So it's 10 billion transistors per processor. So that's kind of the, uh, you know, the amount of transistors we were able to pack into a single chip. Uh, and, I, and, this, and by packing this, you know, so many of these switches, electrical switches into a single chip, we were able to do bigger and better things every decade. And that's precisely what happened. So this is a very nice chart which shows how the packing of transistors into your chips started, um, you know, giving us all these appliances for good or bad, I don't know, but, you know, for most part good, that in the beginning, uh, clearly, you know, the transistor radios came about, then came the mini computers, uh, the internet, uh, mobile, and it's still going on, uh, right? So people are still packing more and more transistors uh, into the into a single chip. And that is why right now the, the mobile phone that you're carrying is, is like, I don't know how many orders of magnitude more powerful than the computer which was on board uh, the Apollo mission. So that is kind of the, the, the power of this transistor scaling. So now, why is it all linked to uh, artificial neural networks? So what happened is that around the time 2010, 
um, the fact that we were able to pack so many transistors into a single chip and we were able to get all these advances uh, in gathering data uh, and processing them meant that the simple mathematical models, the neural network models that, that people created, that's artificial neural networks, uh, so they started becoming, uh, they started working in a sense, you could make them larger and larger, right? And you could feed them with more and more data to train and then eventually uh, you started uh, making, uh, you know, you start getting them to work. It was actually a sudden development. So as I said, even early 2010s, artificial neural networks were so unpopular that they were getting dropped off the curricula in many universities. People thought, okay, this thing is never gonna work. Let's, let's stop working on this research field. But there was this ImageNet contest in 2012 uh, where they used uh, an artificial neural network to figure out uh, images in a data set called ImageNet. So, you know, there are many classes of you know, there's a dogs and horses and whatnot. And then, you know, it's a computer vision problem. It was a challenge, uh, uh, you know, which was, you know, all people could come up with all, all kinds of algorithms and come and see, okay, which one does better. But in 2012, um, artificial neural networks powered by the new uh, amount of data and the processing capability uh, beat every other algorithm in that context by a huge margin and they suddenly became extremely popular thereafter. And since then, people have been, of course, uh, implementing this. And at present, deep neural networks, they are, uh, they come to uh, come close to or even outperform human beings in several cognitive tasks, uh, such as image and speech recognition. So in, in many tasks, in fact, deep neural networks, you know, are, are better performing than human beings, right? So that's, that's really amazing. So if you look at um, the, the current deep neural networks, they may not look much like the Merkulov spitz neuron or the multilayer perceptrons that I showed earlier. Uh, they are, I mean, uh, you know, people have gone into all kinds of, you know, they're just stacking these simple units many times, creating feed forward, residual, recurrent, you know, with feedback connections, hundreds of layers, millions of synaptic weights. Um, you know, if, if you look at computer vision, some of the architectures, you know, have all these strange connections. I mean, each of them is like a neural network layer again. Uh, and natural language processing has, a, you know, again, a lot of different kinds of architectures uh, popping up. But the but you have to remember that all of them has, at the, as a basis, the simple uh, mathematical abstraction of how uh, neurons and synapses are interconnected. So it is really whatever you're seeing and whatever great you're hearing about deep learning and artificial neural networks these days, it is really an emergent behavior of the interconnection of these simple mathematical units, which in turn, which we in turn were uh, initially um, uh, inspired by uh, by the human brain. Um, now, artificial neural networks are uh, the the mainstay of the AI portfolio of the of the IT giants. So, if you look at you know IBM or Google or Facebook, many of the tasks that they are doing they are relying on artificial neural networks. So at the back end, what, you, what they have is deep learning, right? So whether it is for search ranking, whether it is for, um, uh, you know, uh, translating your, your text to speech, or, you know, in order to, like in Facebook, for example, how do they tag your friends? I mean, all that stuff is uh, based on artificial neural networks. Um, they're also finding a lot of applications uh, in anywhere from healthcare, for example, cancer detection, uh, robotics, you know, it's getting extremely, it's benefiting a lot from this. Uh, self-driving cars, I think uh, we wouldn't even be there anywhere close to self-driving uh, without uh, deep neural networks. Um, in basic science, a very interesting development is, for example, uh, you know, we have almost solved the protein folding problem. Uh, that's a fundamental problem which, which we could solve based on deep learning. Uh, agriculture, there's a lot of work going on, weather forecasting, you name it. So a lot of uh, scientific domains where these artificial neural networks are really uh, you know, uh, pushing the frontiers of what we can do in, in these areas. Um, the, uh, they've also been uh, very good at playing games. So there's another area where um, yeah, where artificial neural networks have helped us take on, uh, you know, uh, human beings in, in strategic games. Uh, for example, there was, uh, you know, a, a watershed moment was this one right here in 2016, uh, was the victory of AlphaGo against an 18-time world champion uh, in the game. Uh, his name was Lee Sedol. And after this victory, it was a 4-1 victory, I believe. There's a very nice documentary on that. And after that victory, uh, Lee Sedol actually gave up 
and he he actually retired he said that okay there's no point competing against these things again so so this is a, this is a watershed moment when it comes to uh, you know what these kind of uh, uh, things can do um, and uh, more recently uh, i mean uh, they are also start excelling in uniquely human abilities such as real time debating um, as was recently demonstrated by ibm's project debater so it's a it's an engine that ibm produced which can actually debate uh, uh, in real time uh, again really powered with a whole bunch of artificial neural networks uh, for anywhere from you know speech recognition to you know to, to question and answering and, and all that stuff um, so so far uh, it looks like you know everything is great so as i said you know we have this simple a model um, of uh, biological neurons and synapses. We just scaled it up, and then we got this emergent behavior, uh, and that is what we call deep learning or artificial neural networks, and they are doing wonderful things. But everything is not that rosy, right? So things are, uh, are, are nowhere close to where we want it to be. Um, so in spite of the success of deep learning and artificial neural networks, a key challenge is the computational efficiency. Uh, so as, as I said earlier, uh, the victory of AlphaGo was a remarkable feat. Uh, it was achieved at the expense, however, of orders of magnitude higher energy consumption compared to the human opponent. So if you just look at that machine, which won this uh, competitions again against um, uh, Lee Sedol, uh, it was consuming hundreds of kilowatts of power. Uh, you know, it had 1,202 CPUs and 176 GPUs, graphical processing units. Whereas um, Lisa Doll was presumably consuming this 20 watts that I mentioned earlier. So in some sense, it's great that these machines can beat human beings in a game like uh, Go. But on the other hand, uh, it was done at a tremendous uh, energy expense. And this is what we should be worried about. Um, and if you go forward, um, and, and again, there are a lot of studies along these lines which show that because of deep learning and artificial neural networks, it's actually one of the primary uh, you know, concerns for climate change because a lot of electricity is being diverted into computing because partly because of the success of artificial neural networks. So why is this energy gap there? Um, and what, I mean, this also gives us some clue as to why the brain is so efficient. One uh, key distinction between how you know, the modern computers compute um, and how the brain works is, is, uh, is shown uh, pictorially here. So if you look at modern computers, let's say that a modern computer is implementing a deep artificial neural network, then what it does is it will store uh, all the synaptic weights in a huge memory. And there are these processing units, we call them CPUs, right? Uh, so they are sitting here. And anytime you compute uh, these kind of neural networks, what you do is you take these synaptic weights from here and they remove them into the processing unit uh, and then you kind of uh, you know you need to you know, perform whatever mathematical operations you need to do typically you know matrix vector multiply operations or anything like that you do it in the processor and then you have to store back into the into the synaptic weights and since there are millions of synaptic weights each time you move these weights into the processor and back and forth you consume a lot of energy and this is fundamentally different from how the brain computes so if you look at the mammalian brain uh, it is deeply entwined memory and processing. You cannot really say, oh, this is where processing happens. This is where memory is. It's all connected. It's a mesh of things, right? Uh, so this is one key distinction between modern computers and mammalian brains. And this is something that, uh, in, at least in my group, we are really trying hard to solve this problem uh, through this concept of in-memory computing. Um, yeah, so I just uh, I don't want to go into the weeds of the whole thing. So the whole idea is for, as follows. So you have a conventional computing system, which is um, which is, you know, as I said, it has a processing unit here um, and then uh, sorry, you have a processing unit here and then you have the memory here. And as I said, you need to keep on shuttling data back and forth in order to compute. But our idea is basically to uh, to have the memory compute by itself by using the physics of memory devices. So it's very similar to how the brain works in some sense, uh, because um, you know, in the brain, you have a synaptic network, uh, which is kind of fixed. And then that also has the memory and that signal uh, 
progresses through the network, it starts, it is computes on its own in place, right? So there is no processor memory dichotomy in the, in the human brain. Um, again, so this is the whole idea of in-memory computing. So I think it's worth remembering these names that in-memory computing is one of the most promising paradigms, uh, which is a non von Neumann paradigm, you know, which doesn't have this uh, processor memory dichotomy. It's a huge area of research with a lot of research work going on in India and elsewhere. So it's good to keep, uh, keep these kind of uh, terms uh, uh, in your mind. And if you want to know more about in-memory computing, you can always go and read this review article that we recently published, um, I mean, we published last year. So it's a fascinating way of computing. Uh, it's kind of brain spied in a sense that you want to compute in memory, like in the human brain. Um, and I just want to show one example of how you would do like one of the things that we are trying to do is to use these kind of uh, tiny memory devices. So one of them is called face change memory. So the whole idea would be to mimic the synapses in the brain because synapses are like the like the memory in the brain. Right. So you would like to mimic them. And we use these kind of nanoscale devices called phase change memory. Uh, it's a very special kind of material uh, which can change from crystalline to amorphous when you apply electrical pulses. So you sandwich them between metal electrodes and then you can actually alter the, the phase configuration. And when you alter the phase configuration, your, um, your resistance is, is changing as, as, as shown here, right? So this is like a tunable resistor, but nanoscale. Just to give you an idea, uh, a coronavirus is larger than uh, the diameter of, of this thing. So think about it, right? It's a tiny nanoscale device whose resistance can be tuned by applying electrical pulses. So uh, we are, our idea, of course, is to make something which looks like the synapse, the tiny brain-like synapse that I talked about earlier. So what we did is we connected uh, these kind of tiny nanoscale devices into these so-called crossbar configurations. Uh, so what it does is it will emulate a neural network. So it, it is sort of like having the presynaptic neurons here in that in this case, there are two of them connected to postsynaptic neurons. And these tiny nanoscale devices will be now these synaptic junctions. So the connections that I talked about earlier. And, um, and in this way, we can, we can do exactly what I showed earlier. When you know, one neuron talks to one neuronal layer talks to another neuronal layer, the propagation of the signals can be captured in this manner. And that whole propagation is now exploiting the physics of the devices in a sense, you know, it just follows the standard circuit laws that we are familiar with, Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's current summation law. So it's all happening in place, just like in the synaptic layer in the biological brain. Moreover, by applying electrical pulses, we can also tune the, the, the synaptic weight, again, just like in the human brain. So it's almost like mimicking the neural networks in hardware using nanoscale devices, right? So that's the whole idea here. Um, so we are one of the leading groups in the world doing this kind of stuff. So we recently fabricated a chip, uh, which is the first of its kind. Uh, it's a neural network. Uh, uh so So these are these memory devices. Yeah, so, so this is this is one of the you know first chips of its type where, as I said earlier, all these synaptic weights and neurons are implemented in hardware. They are fixed in hardware, so there is really no processor memory dichotomy, as I told earlier. Um, and it really is kind of a way to mimic the biological neural networks in hardware using these nanoscale devices. Um, right, so that is uh, a big part of our work, which is like, you know, trying to address the energy efficiency problem of uh, biological neural networks. And, um, uh, and as I said, a very big approach, a very promising approach in that direction is the so-called uh, in-memory computing, computing in-memory. Now let's look at some of the algorithmic challenges which are out there, right? 
before I go there, I'll probably uh, skip over it. So I just want to quickly tell that, you know, there's also a lot of attempt towards uh, making uh, the neural networks more biologically plausible, more and more like the real biological uh, neural networks. Um, so if, if you look at the conventional artificial neural networks, uh, you have, you know, if you look at just one of these neurons and synapses that I talked about earlier, uh, these are all very simple abstractions of the of the of the neurons and synapses, right? It's kind of, you know, all the way from a clock spitz neuron. It's it's not too different from that. Um, but uh, clearly, the biological neurons they have dynamics. So that means that if you have a neuron, it has some additional dynamics. If you look at the synapse again, it's not like just a weighting of the signal, but rather it has some other time dimension to it. Um, so one big part of the research which is going on in the world is trying to make these neural networks more and more biologically plausible, uh, adding more and more features that you learn from the brain and incorporate it into the computational models. So this is another big area of research. Um, and there are a lot of reasons why people are interested in it, um, because first of all, uh, in biological neural networks, you know, it's so-called asynchronous processing, which means that it's a computer which doesn't compute when you don't have the signal. For example, uh, you know, when you are not looking at an object, you don't have to compute. Your brain can just, you know, the visual part of the brain can just rest, right? So, but in a conventional computing systems, as you know, the clock is always running. So this is fundamentally different in the case of biological brain. So you would like to have that feature in there. Um, again, as I said, um, uh, time plays a big role in biological neural networks because it are spikes and spikes are prop propagating information, whereas in uh, conventional computing systems, time doesn't play a role at all, more or less. Um, learning is very local. This is something very specialized. You know, it is not. It is like whenever two neurons are uh, propagating signals between each other, the synaptic strengths get weakened or strengthened, and that is kind of very unique to the brain how it computes. Again, this is something that we haven't fully understood. Uh, and the, as I said, the synapses have a lot of dynamics which are again not uh, fully captured or understood. Uh, in uh, and these are these are big area of research going on there. Um, again. Um, uh, without delving too much on it. So a big part of uh, our group's work again is on trying to make these neural networks more and more biologically plausible, right? Adding more features, implementing them on the right hardware and so on and so forth. Now comes uh, the next key challenge of artificial neural networks. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so as I said, uh, artificial neural networks are really great, right? I mean, they are able to uh, beat human beings in perception, perception tasks like, you know, the ImageNet context I mentioned earlier. But there are some fundamental flaws. Uh, if you take a deep neural network, a state-of-the-art deep neural network, and if it uh, if it is trained on ImageNet and it can classify a whole bunch of images, uh, um, you know, if you show it this particular image here, it will say that it's a teddy bear, uh, which of course it's not, right? Because the reason why it's saying it's a teddy bear is because uh, it it has this fur, it is round, you know, it kind of thinks it's a teddy bear. So this is a fundamental problem that uh, conventional deep neural networks cannot uh, really understand the material. It is just kind of doing this classification task that I talked about earlier. Uh, it gets even more interesting. Uh, suppose you have uh, a neural network which is trained, uh, you know, to learn like a monkey sitting in the brain, as I say, monkey sitting in the forest. Then uh, if you just put a guitar on top of the monkey, then suddenly it thinks that the guitar is a bird. Uh, presumably because the guitar is like you know colorful and it's in a jungle setting so it, think, it thinks it's a, it's a bird uh, so again showing that these neural networks have really no fundamental understanding of what is going on uh, in the in the world there are many other interesting examples here for example uh, deep neural networks are very good at captioning problems um, you know there you can give them like an image and it will tell you you know what is the caption of that image all automatically but if you look at these images here uh, it says a man riding a motorcycle on a beach, an airplane is parked on the tarmac at an air, 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 airport, a group of people standing on top of a beach. You know, all of them are sort of correct, but they also show that really these computing systems, these artificial neural networks have really no fundamental understanding as to you know, what these pictures are trying to convey. So they have no idea. For example, this is not just a group of people standing on top of a beach, right? So this is really the problem with uh, conventional artificial neural networks. Um, so how to tackle this problem? So one thing that we are doing uh, in our group to tackle that is to take neural networks and um, and use them for the perception task because that's where they are really good at because you can see objects, you can classify objects, and that is really the strength of uh, artificial neural networks. But then you marry that 
with something called symbolic AI. That means you start combining it with logical reasoning. Uh, and we have a very nice way in which you combine them. And that's what we call the neural vector symbolic architecture. Uh, again, there is a nice blog article that we wrote, uh, which would be very useful reading for that. This is one of the fundamental uh, problems if you want to go to the next step of uh, artificial intelligence or brain spread computing is, I mean, we kind of have solved the perception problem with neural networks, but we have to marry that with the reasoning, right? This is the part where we are really still extremely weak. So finally, I will, I'll conclude with uh, some outlook and summary. Um, so the, the artificial uh, intelligence revolution uh, is likely to shape our society and economics in profound ways. I think uh, many of us will be working in this field, especially the younger ones. I think this is really an area where there's a lot of activity going on and is going to shape our society and economics beyond, uh, you know, in, in very profound ways uh, beyond our imagination. And, uh, and this is something that we have to be, uh, you know, we have to be wary of. Um, and we should also uh, realize that this revolution was fueled largely by artificial neural networks, and which in turn was inspired by brain spike computing. Um, and the AI revolution is also likely to dramatically change the landscape of our computing systems uh, as we transition away from the semiconductor scaling laws that I mentioned earlier. So you would see maybe a completely different type of computers in the future and then the ones you are used to in your laptop or your mobile phones. Um, but where do we stand compared to natural intelligence? You know, because I told in the very beginning that you would like to figure out how the brain works and try to create this superhuman brain. We are very far away from that, right? Um, so right now we are, um, you know, a few years back, IBM created this nice taxonomy of artificial intelligence. Uh, so narrow AI, broad AI, and general AI. Uh, narrow AI is where, you know, AI systems perform exceedingly well in a single task in a single domain, like, you know, like the visual perception or speech to text and these kind of things. So we are extremely good here. Then there is the broad AI where a system can excel in multiple tasks across multiple domains. Um, it should also be able to reason and explain and learn from fewer examples. So this is sort of the topics that I mentioned to you, the neural vector symbolic AI kind of problems where you would like to combine perception with reasoning. Um, and this is the current frontier of AI. So if anyone is doing a PhD research topic, this is probably a good place to be in, right? And down the road comes general AI that comes closer uh, to true fluid intelligence, you know, solving IQ tests, uh, having common sense, having empathy, emotions, these kind of things, right? So that is a so-called general AI, and we are potentially decades away even now from general AI. So I don't think we have anything close to Android Kunya Pen uh, right now or anywhere close to that in the next uh, one or two decades. Um, and in parallel, there'll be significant advances in the hardware domain uh, that will fuel the algorithmic advances, right? So we are learning more and more from computational neuroscience as to how brain is working. And then we are also building our computing systems, which are looking more and more like how the brain looks like. So that's kind of the, the future here. Yeah, so to summarize, a brain is this remarkably unique supercomputer that each of us possess, and we should be extremely proud of it, use it wisely, use it for good things, right? So that's kind of the message here. Uh, an adequate theory of how brain computes, unfortunately, is still lacking. We, are, we, are, we still don't know clearly what are the key concepts there. Um, artificial neural networks loosely inspired by how brain computes based on these very simple models of biological neurons, um, along with advances information technology has really assured in a new AI revolution, which is changing our lives in profound manner. Um, but to address the energy efficiency problem, because there's this huge disconnect between the energy it takes uh, to compute artificial neural networks and, uh, you know, and how it is happening in the brain, new forms of computing, such as in-memory computing, are being explored, and I showed some examples of that. Um, there is also like, you know, significant extensions to traditional artificial neural networks uh, being proposed to overcome the shortcomings, such as, you know, more biologically plausible um, artificial neural networks, making it more and more like biology and also neurosymbolic architectures, which combine perception with, uh, with reasoning. Um, still, we are at the very early, so early days of brain spread computing, and I think it'll be a, it's a fantastic research area to be on uh, because a lot of unknowns, you know, things are changing by the week sometimes. So I think I would encourage all the youngsters and, and uh, you know, young researchers to potentially get interested in this topic and contribute a lot of open problems. So it's, it's very good for research. 
so with that, I would like to conclude uh, and I would like to thank again all the organizers for inviting me over and I look forward to receiving some questions. Thank you very much, sir, for that very informative session. Uh, now it is open to the participants. We'll have a discussion session now. You can ask your doubts and all in this particular session. It's over to participants. So shall I begin with? Uh, so you mentioned about that uh, in-memory chip that has been developed in IBM. Uh, actually a very uh, fascinating one, I think. Uh, is it a commercially developed one or it's been used for the research in IBM itself? Or can you tell about the area sure. by which it can be used in a ready-made fashion? Um, yeah, it is, it is really a research chip. So, so the, you know, one of the mandates of IBM AI hardware center is to build, uh, you know, future chips for AI, right? So like, you know, so we are looking at new concepts. So there are, uh, there is a roadmap towards, you know, what kind of new architectures are coming on, right? So clearly, as you can see, I don't know if I have that slide already here in one of the yeah, yeah. Just to give you an idea on how the commercial landscape is, correct? So, uh, so people have realized that modern computing systems are are really equipped for brain-inspired computing. So, these people know for a while now. So, so what they're doing is they're taking your conventional computing system, right? And they're trying to kind of improve it. That's one attempt. So, by adding, you know, so if you look at a conventional computing system, you have the memory uh, storage hierarchy, and then you have your processor, right? Um, so, what people are trying to do is to add on to the memory storage hierarchy with things like you know near memory computing adding new types of memory like storage class memory trying to improve the existing computing system to make them uh, more and more amenable for uh, brain spike computing or for artificial neural networks so this is one uh, you know th that's the current state of research uh, but on the side people are trying to build uh, conventional digital accelerators where they optimize the the processors and you know the you know, memory they're trying to use conventional digital techniques to build custom accelerators so this is the area where there's a lot of uh, research and development going on some of them are commercial some of them are in the research phase all the companies including uh, you know uh, amazon tesla and all that are building these kind of custom chips which are meant for uh, running deep neural networks right uh, this is a very active area of research so i would say in terms of time frame we are here right now what we are doing in IBM uh, is to look ahead and see, okay, now what is beyond this, right? So that is where we are. So this chip, the in-memory are within this context where we are really deviating from, uh, you know, the standard digital uh, computing systems and going to really accelerators which are based on, uh, you know, the non-separation of memory and processing uh, and also using new types of devices like uh, the so-called phase change memory device and so on. So right now that chip that I showed earlier is a research prototype. And the hope is that in, in like say five years or less than five years that this would be commercialized. Uh, as I said, this is one of the first of its kind in the world. So it was a highlight paper at the VLSI this year. Um, so, I mean, you know, so it's, it's clearly a research chip, uh, but uh, that concept is already uh, being, I mean, there are startups who are trying to concept, uh, I mean, uh, which are trying to commercialize this technology that are even some of them, even from my own group has spun off to, to do these kind of things. Uh, but this is a, as a conceptual level, it's there, but, you know, people are now in the process of commercializing it, right? Uh, but I just want to point out that this is really the roadmap, right? So, so conventional computing systems, accelerators, which are customized for this, but based on conventional digital acceleration, and then comes the, uh, you know, non four and accelerators with the, with the new types of devices, more exotic devices. Uh, so recently we had a release of a Google Pixel phone, uh, which has been featured with some AI chip. I'm not, uh, we are not much aware of what is inside, but that is what the feature we mm -hmm. heard of. Can you tell more yeah, about yeah. So, the add to it? Yeah, so these are all coming into this kind of category in the middle. So what people are doing right now is that they are complementing uh, uh, their either their processors or their chips with these kind of customized um, digital accelerators, you call it, right? So they're building some computer chips which are specifically meant to run artificial neural networks. Then you are incorporating that into your processor 
It can also be a standalone accelerator. For example, you may want to have like an accelerator, like in your car, right? So for example, Tesla use a lot of deep learning for their you know, autonomous drive features. So for that, they have their own accelerator they are using, Amazon and all those people have their own accelerators, right? So they use them for their internal um, uh, workloads. Google has the TPU, uh, which is a tensor processing unit. Yeah. It's again, they use it for their internal uh, workloads. So, so I think, I said, this is where, uh, if you see like products, this is where you see them, right? Uh, and whatever is in this last segment is, is, is further out. So I wouldn't classify the architecture of this middle class like brain inspired. I mean, the algorithms are brain inspired to some extent, but they are still running on more or less conventional digital uh, you know, computing principles, right? So the big distinction from here to here is that the architecture itself is changing. Yeah, so I think what you mentioned about, about Google is exactly right. So th this is the kind of the thing that you see uh, increasingly these days that people are putting these custom accelerators in their mobile phones and you know, all kind of stuff like that. Yeah, it's, it's an extremely fast uh, growing field. Uh, uh, this is like, you know, I haven't seen so much activity in the field of computer architecture, uh, like, you know, prior to this. This is really a, I mean, there are multiple reasons for that. So one of them is that uh, Moore's law is slowing down, right? That means that we are not able to pack as many transistors as before, like, like we used to. Like I showed this graph, which was going nicely, right? We are able to pack transistors um, uh, more and more. Uh, so this has really slowed down, uh, which meant that people have to now look at new architectures, right? So this is one reason. The other reason is AI because of deep neural networks and the success of AI. So but the combination of the two means that everyone is looking at you know, new architectures, right? So it's, it's one of the most active areas of research right now. Thank you very much, sir. So over to participants, we'll have a discussion now. If you have any uh, problem in asking, in this Google Meet, many are watching in YouTube channel also. You can either WhatsApp in the group, you can leave a message in the WhatsApp group, what we have created for the participants. You either leave a message so that we will convey it in the Google Meet session, or you can uh, directly ask in the session if you have the doubts. Sir, I would also like to uh, know more about, uh, I, I am a researcher in the field of uh, flash memory, actually. I am going on okay. with my research work. I, I would like to know about the um, term called memristor memory, which we oftenly used with this uh, AI, yeah. uh, uh, something, yes. uh, something which is fascinating. So can you comment on that particular memory? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it? yeah. Yeah, so so this, this particular device is a memristor. I mean, I just want to, uh, I, I mean, I, di I didn't, I didn't want to bring up the term because you know of the, uh, you know, we had a wide range of audience, right? Uh, sorry about that. I, let me just come back to the. Yeah. So that's that's a very good question. Yeah. So this this particular, I told you about in-memory computing, right? So in-memory computing means that you need to compute uh, in memory by exploiting the physics of the memory devices. Correct. Uh, so the idea is that you know if you look at a conventional computing system, memory is a place where you just store your data. Uh, it's like you you know it's just a storage space right you just store that ones and zeros and then you know then you all the processing is happening in the processor side but here if you want to compute in memory then you have to use the physics of the memory to compute so you are uh, performing like say matrix vector multiply operation using the physics like ohm's law and kirchhoff's current summation law uh, as i showed uh, in the in the subsequent slide and uh, one of the primary candidates for uh, this in-memory computing is the so-called memristic devices, and phase change memory is a memristor. Uh, a memristor is just a resistor with memory. Okay, that means that a memristor can remember the the, mem the pulses that it received earlier. So, if you have a, a phase change memory device shown here, so it's a memristor. Uh, you apply some electrical pulses. It remembers what the electrical pulses it received because the phase configuration was changing accordingly. Right, so it is a resistor which has memory, and that is why it's called memristor. So, so you can think of uh, phase change memory as a as a memristor. There are also other types of memristors there based on metal oxides and and whatnot. So they're all falling into the category of memristic devices. Uh, 
Uh, and a memristive device is ideal for uh, brain spread computing because if you look at a synapse in the brain, it is very similar to something with memory because a synapse has is, is essentially a waiting right of the signal. So it's a it's a you know you have you know some signal coming from a presynaptic neuron which get weighted by the synapse and then it comes out as prosynaptic spike. Uh, so that waiting is actually like a resistance or conductance. And that depends on the spikes that it has seen before. So you, you see the connection? So it is just like electrical pulses are like the spikes in the brain and the varying conductance is like the varying synaptic weight in the biological synapse. So that is where the connections come from. Uh, but Professor Hita, I, I mean, I would also like to let you know that, you know, flash memory itself is a candidate for these kind of things. So maybe that's something that you may want to look at in your research, because there is something that you could also do with flash uh, to also realize some of the things uh, here, because flash is also having some of these properties which you can exploit. So are you working on uh, on like uh, or which aspect of flash are you researching there? Sir, I'm mainly working on the page replacement uh, algorithms and its uh, variations that is needed for flash memories rather than the conventional memories because flash is, flash is very particular uh, in its wear leveling and all so i'm working yes, on the yes, algorithms yes. So related more on this more, more on this the storage, uh, uh, storage. Stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah 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 but if you really take this flash memory cell and look at the physics of the device is again something that we do you know in, 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 with, in, uh, here as well is that you can actually implement some of these circuits also using the the physics of flash memory devices uh, but okay, of course, that is going more into the device side, you know, the device, device physics side, side of yes. things, right? I, but, I had uh, gone much to the software yeah, yeah, yeah. side rather than the hardware area. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but but of course, I mean, at, at the high level, there is also a lot of software here as well, right? Yeah. I mean, this is just the you know the basic principle, but uh, you know how you like from here to getting into a chip like this, uh, there's a lot of uh, architecture and software on top of it. Okay. Yes. Uh, but but yeah, so I, I would like to, you know, like so flash memory and memristors are all candidates to implement uh, this kind of systems that I showed earlier, but in particular memory steel devices, they're particularly nice for that. Thank you, sir. So if you have any doubts regarding the session or the related applications, you can raise it now. Students can also ask your doubts. It's not uh, it's not necessary that you should ask a serious doubt if you have any application related yeah, please, questions yeah. uh, you can raise it now they always say there are no stupid questions only stupid answers so <laughs> <laughs> i think the majority majority of our participants are students uh, so i don't know whether they are doubting to doubt whether the question is relevant or not maybe yeah i think i think you can use the chat uh, if you want i mean we can if it, if if that's preventing questions yeah you can even uh, uh, type your questions in the chat box if needed it's uh, activated the chat box is activated you can leave your questions there in the chat box also So we would also like to know the uh, research, what has been going on in uh, IBM labs, because uh, whenever we talk about the computer companies, we always consider IBM as the intelligent one, uh, something which is so intelligent. Google and all we feel as a charm baby, uh, but IBM is always a serious one uh, looking at research. Uh, so can you tell us more about what research or what outcome is that from the IBM? What all projects are going on there? Sure. Um, yeah, so IBM, uh, you know, I think part of the reason is probably because IBM is also the oldest company, like it's, it's past 100 years, right? So it's the largest, uh, sorry, it's the oldest IT company, uh, which kind of survived all the uh, phases of computing, right? I mean, uh, IBM was, um, uh, you know, from, the, uh, from hard disk drives, personal computers, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, the deep blue, right, for beating chess, uh, and um, then comes, um, you know, the AI, the recent uh, developments in AI and so on. So I think IBM has a long history in the area of computing, and IBM also maintained a very strong research team always. So there was IBM research was a big part of IBM, 
they always used to invest a lot in research and kept research separate from development. So we were given a, like a free hand to go and try out completely crazy ideas, right? Unlike many other companies who are like more working on shorter term goals. So this is, I think, one of the reasons why IBM is still perceived as a as a company which is at the forefront of research. Uh, but of course, things are, you know, I mean, other companies are also doing great. I mean, you know, Google is very good in AI and, you know, there are companies which do amazingly well these days. Uh, but IBM had this history uh, going back uh, decades. Um, but one key thing in IBM research compared to other uh, companies is that we have the full stack. So we go all the way from fundamental physics and mathematics all the way to software uh, services, right? So that we have that breadth which is something which is very difficult to emulate in industry. Uh, because if you look at many of the newcomers in the field, like the Googles and the Facebooks, they have very good software, but they won't have the you know, expertise in fundamental physics, right, or devices. Um, and and it's, you can see the same pattern in, in many other uh, sectors. Um, right, so we do have uh, research all the way from, as I said, from basic physics and basic mathematics all the way to, to software and, uh, you know, and services. Um, so we have, uh, there's a lot of focus these days on um, new forms of computing, like the one that I talked about. Uh, we club it together with AI in general, artificial intelligence, uh, but then there is a quantum computing is another big area. Um, and there's a lot of research on on cloud, right? Cloud is extremely getting extremely uh, you know relevant these days. So there's a lot of work in in these sectors in IBM. I mean, quantum computing is one one big uh, you know that's also an area where IBM is really uh, leading the race. Yeah. Um, and uh, besides these kind of uh, research uh, topics in IBM research, we also have something called exploratory uh, science, pro science uh, pillar. So where we look at very fundamental questions, right? So it need not even be, uh, I mean, mostly related to computing, but they are like very fundamental physics problems or math problems which we try to solve. Um, some of the uh, projects that I showed, like this neuro vector symbolic AI, is within uh, the exploratory science category. So where we are trying to see whether a computer can solve, uh, you know, IQ tests, right? So these kind of things. Uh, so this is something which doesn't have an immediate business goal, but you really want to understand, you know, what are the basic principles which enable us to do that. Uh, yeah. So I would say quantum AI, hybrid cloud. Um, then exploratory science broadly, right? So this is kind of the uh, the big IBM research and security. Sorry, security is another big area where IBM is invested heavily on. Uh, especially with the quantum computers coming on, I think you, your security systems have to be even better. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we have a question in the chat box regarding the uh, accuracy level of the uh, neural networks or how we can actually uh, up to what percentage of accuracy we have reached because we, have, we are trying to mimic the human brain and we have achieved some still we have more to go what mm -hmm. percentage of accuracy we have reached regarding this uh, uh, idea what we yeah. have conceived yeah so I, I think it should be very clear that you know <clears throat> in terms of um, in, in perception tasks, like suppose you're looking at, you know, images and seeing if it's a cat or a dog or whatnot, I think we are definitely, uh, you know, beating human level performance, right? Because computers are, are very good at finding patterns in data and so on. So it's very difficult to compete with, uh, with a AI system when it comes to that. That is why, you know, radiologists are probably going to lose their job because computers might uh, do the, you know, that kind of jobs much better, like detecting cancer and these sort of things, because they can easily find patterns much better. Um, so on that respect, yes, right? So if you have a, a fixed data set you are trained on, uh, then, you know, they are very good at it. But as I said, there are all these corner cases that I showed. Like, for example, if you put a guitar on top of a monkey, then suddenly the guitar becomes a bird, right? So the, the computers can make these kind of huge mistakes which human beings don't. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to evaluate where we stand. Uh, so clearly, if you don't really solve that kind of issues, I think uh, computers really cannot take over. I mean, we always need human monitoring. Otherwise, you know, in, in mission critical tasks, imagine that, you know, a computer is making such kind of stupid mistakes, right? So that's kind of the challenge right now. And that is why I think we need to always have uh, neural networks with something else. So neural network with something else is the only way in which we can potentially uh, you know, beat this, uh, you know, beat human level performance. Um, so I, I just want to make a distinction between pure perception on trained data sets. Of course, they are the best. There's no question about it. 
But in a generic system where you have, you know, out of distribution samples, like the ones that I showed, I think we are not there yet. We still need to uh, improve on that. Okay, so thank you very much, sir. You really ignited the organic supercomputer. We, I really got stuck with that word, organic supercomputer, what we bustle. <laughs> I just feel like having a computer uh, in ourselves. I, I'm just visualizing that particular figure when you told the word uh, organic supercomputer. Really, we yeah. all are supercomputers, right? Because Absolutely, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We are exploring the uh, exploring the brain using our brain itself. So it's yeah. really, really a wonderful idea. So and, thank you and, for uh, yeah, and just to, just to add on to that, I mean, what is really fascinating is that, you know, our sensory perception is extremely weak, right? So we only had, because we got all this from evolution and evolution only had two goals, to, to reproduce and to eat, right? So this is the only two goals that we had. So we had this very limited perception whereby we are only able to see a narrow spectrum in the electromagnetic base, right? If you look at it, right? So we could only probe this tiny thing uh, our brain had the computing power and the clock frequency to match like things like, okay, you know, you should be able to escape from animals or, you know, uh, hang on to a branch on the tree, right? So that's kind of our time scale that we, we were interested in. Uh, so we were only working in that millisecond to seconds kind of time scale, uh, the, the perception wise. And with that, we are able to figure out, oh, these many billion years Big Bang hack happened, right? And we were able to go and look at, you know, electrons and neutrons and create atom bombs. So it's just amazing what a supercomputer can do with such limited perception, correct? Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that especially for the students, I always think that they should always remember that we are in possession of this compute cluster, right? Which is so superior to anything out there that we don't even understand how the hell it works. And, uh, and uh, to kind of not use it, right? Or use it in a wrong way is unthinkable. Right? It's the biggest crime you can do. <laughs> anyway, God, the great creator, uh, he made such a big cluster. Amazing. Uh, amazing. Cluster for each other. Amazing. So th <laughs> thank you very much, sir, for igniting or putting on the spikes on this organic computer so that even we can start thinking about how gifted we are. Uh, we are really gifted with the. Uh, uh, such a brain. So many of us are not using, they all are in a sleep state. So let the session be, <laughs> uh, let the session be a spiking session for them to ignite their brain and to start thinking about uh, how we can utilize our brain for a future, not only for research, to do good for the uh, society. For society. Too. Okay. Society too. So thank you very much, sir. I think uh, uh, we will, since the participants are not having much uh, doubts and all better, uh, we'll wind this up. Um, I would like to uh, announce certain things on behalf of the participants, for the participants. Uh, we'll be putting a feedback form now in the chat box. Uh, you need to fill the feedback form within half an hour, within half an hour of the webinar, uh, so that we will generate certificates from the data what you are providing to the feedback form. So make sure that you are uh, correctly uh, submitting your name without any issues in the spelling and all your name, your uh, institution's name, everything. Make sure that you are submitting it uh, properly. And we are also looking forward for your valuable feedbacks to uh, Letitla College and Computer Science Department will be coming out with more brainstorming sessions in future too. So kindly follow the YouTube channel of our college. We will be telecasting lively all the uh, all webinars what we are conducting nowadays, so it'll be really useful for you too. The feedback link is also put there in the YouTube description box, YouTube channel description box. So those who have attended the program through YouTube uh, live link, kindly go through the description box. You can see the feedback form link there. Kindly complete submitting your feedback forms within half an hour from this webinar. Uh, let me go on with my duty of proposing Vote of thanks for this wonderful session. Uh, even though the pandemic raised many challenges before us, I think uh, the pandemic opened up new possibilities in the world to share the knowledge. It's oh, thanks to the pandemic because uh, we, can, we can't ever think of having such a session uh, in an offline mode. Because presently we have participants from UAE, from India, and Sir is there from Switzerland and uh, some other from United States. And we are so happy uh, that we started our uh, pandemic even 
uh, opened up new possibilities in the world of knowledge sharing. It actually unlocked the horizons of knowledge and we start thinking about or we start uh, understanding how we can stand united even in a virtual umbrella. Uh, so uh, the brain, the human brain, the fascinating human brain, uh, that was the topic of today's session. And I'm very sure that the session was so informative and valuable. Dear sir, we really felt the passion what you have in this area. Uh, through your session, uh, and not only the knowledge you have shared, you, you shared a message that we need to be passionate in our field to uh, come out with uh, uh, something new and something useful. So we really felt the passion what you have in this area. And I hope this will open up new research thought among the minds of the participants too. So on behalf of Little Flower College on, or, and all the participants of the session, I wish Dr. Abu Sebastian the very best for all his future works and also we expect more from IBM. We are very happy that one among us, one from the one from the Kerala itself is doing wonderful job there in IBM. We are very proud of you, sir. Uh, so on behalf of all gathered here, I wholeheartedly thank you, sir, for giving us such an in-depth idea about brain-inspired computing. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. I also take this opportunity to thank our Billard principal, Dr. Sister Walsa May, for her valuable guidance and the never ending support what Sister is offering to us in all our endeavors. Special thanks to all the faculty members and researchers and students from various parts of the country and great appreciation and gratitude to the faculties and the A-level computer science and uh, IT students from Cambridge International School, Dubai. I also take this opportunity to thank the graceful presence of the eminent faculties and researchers from other countries too. A word of gratitude to all my dear colleagues and students of Little Flower College for their cooperation throughout the program. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you very much, sir, for being with us once again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hill. Uh, participants, please don't uh, forget to fill the uh, feedback form because we'll be generating uh, the certificates from the feedback form what, you, what you'll be submitting. So make sure that you are submitting the feedback forms. Uh, within half an hour, the certificates will be sent to your registered uh, mail ID within a week. Thank you. Thank you all.